All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am so sorry. We are about seven minutes late. <laughs> I tried to do this through another way and um, yeah, well, long story. So welcome and um, Jiva Maya Yoga Wisdom Talks. We're still in July. We're still with the subject of spirituality in the workplace. And today we are thrilled to welcome Alan Shelton who is the enlightened um, entrepreneur <laughs> of all times. Um, and Alan's gonna be speaking with us about um, spirituality in the corporate world, which is kind of an interesting combination of words. So without further ado, especially as we're running a little late, we will go over a little bit, so we won't be cheating anybody out of 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to ask Alan, just jump in right away and, Let's start with what does the word spirituality mean to you and how on earth did you start on this journey? Well, I think spirituality for me is probably a lot like it is for you in the yoga world, which is your specialty. And so um, I think in, in my world, I lived a life that had a lot of intellectual kind of stuff in it. And that was my belief that the intellect would lead you to where it needed to be. So ideas and concepts and all of those things are what I really practiced and got good at in order to do what I did. But at one point in time, um, there was a part that was just speaking within me that said, if you don't live it tangibly, if it doesn't live on the ground, then um, what use is all of this? And so I, I think the tangibility, I always use that word, but I think that's the beckoning call of anybody on a spiritual path, whether, as I say, whether it be yoga or whether it be whatever way you you happen to move down the spiritual path, it's it's got to live in the here and now. And if it doesn't live in the here and now, there's a there's a there's just a knowing. And so that's what began me when that when that hit me, I knew I was no longer a philosopher. I was now going to be a mystic because, um, you know, thinking it what thinking it was no longer good enough. So you spent some time in an ashram, I believe, and that kind of spurred things even further along. I, I did. I did. I mean, I this kind of discovery that, you know, I, I I I wanted to walk a path. It was a real thing that was, you know, my life needed to reflect something. Um, when when that when that understanding began to really blossom within me, I was I actually was at the height of my career. I had a merger acquisition uh, firm on the West Coast in Newport Beach. I was being quoted in the Wall Street Journal. I was the next up and coming, whatever it was they thought I was supposed to be. And um, I, I, I started to read every book. I went through things, you know, Course on Miracles, Landmark, you name it. I did all of that stuff. And then one day I heard uh, a, a master in India speak and he spoke about the ego. And I had narrowed it down. I was finally like, I go, it, it, where, whatever the problem is, it lives in how the ego operates. I, I was able to get to that. And he spoke about the ego. And, and, and there was just, there was a moment where I said, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. And it's the first time I'd ever heard anybody speak. And I had that kind of a feeling about it. So two weeks later, I was on a plane to India and I was uh, in Osho's ashram in Pune for the next three years more or less uh, i'd come home a little bit and then and then and then the biggest part of four years after that so there was about a seven year period um the first three years i was pretty much out of the corporate world i sold my pra i sold the company and everything the next the, the the second piece of that i actually came back and worked here about half time and was in the ashram half time and so that became you know that became my life and so when i came back you know i was 30 seven when I left. So I was about 44 when I came back. I had a lot of career left. And so I had this real firm planting. I had one foot really in the spiritual world. And there was no doubt I was a business guy. So so it was kind of left up to me, you know, to figure that out. And I, I spent a lot of time, by the way, in the beginning, trying to get away from the blacks. I, I, I had put the business world on the Darth Vader black side, and I was going to do everything I could to stay away from that. And uh, much like the Jonah and the whale story, the whale kept burping me back up on the corporate beach. And so, it, because that's what I was meant to do. That's what I was built to do. So I had to come to terms with that. I had to go, oh, this is what I, this is what I do. And somehow or another, the spiritual piece has to fit in this. I'm not sure what that looks like, but we'll figure that one out. And so I often tell uh, corporate folks that I meet that story. And then I say, let me save you some time. You can, 
you can be like me and get burped up on the beach with gastric juices and all, or you can get yourself a Jeep and a picnic basket and drive down the path, but you're going to end up on this beach. This is, this is, this is where right. you're going to live. So if, you're, if right. you're going to be a spiritual seeker and you're in the corporate world, this is where it's going to take place. So, yeah. So corporations pretty much around the world contact you. What happens when a corporation, approaches you how do you respond to them i mean how how is it possible to bring a whole corporation to a place of consciousness what is what is your role in that and how do, how are you able to help them manifest that it, it goes back to the same thing you and i was talking about i mean in a way if you think about it the corporate world is like any other world the tradition has been that we have what i call helicopter uh, consultants that so a lot of the famous people that you see that talk to corporations, they helicopter in, they give a speech, everybody comes to it, the company pays for it, and then everybody goes back to work. And so um, what is easy to see, though, that's, that's not a spiritual path. All that is is a, a ticket to the movie every now and then. So, so the reality is, how do you embed that in the ongoings of, a, a, you know, of, a, of an operation of a, of a, you know, a company and it's all, of its, all of its tentacles? So what the, what happens is if you have some credibility and you've been there before, when you speak into the conversation, uh, um, it's, it's, it's much like a yoga therapist that speaks about something medical. You stop and you listen. This person has experience. They're credible. So there are things, and it's that tangibility thing. In the corporate world, great leadership is recognized by the presence of those who are great leaders. And so those companies are always after that. And so you need to know, this is what I'm going to speak about. Because what I, what I was able to see was that presence anywhere is part of the spiritual movement. Um, as the ego uh, reduces its radio noise between you and consciousness itself, presence starts to emit. It, you broadcast and you magnetize through presence. And so it became really obvious that um, it was it would be very easy to put a spiritual path in place and simply clothe it with business terminology and but that because that's exactly what they wanted but it had to be tangible how did you act how do you actually go in and say i can teach your people to be something that they're not at this point in time and what what that is is tangible another word another word we use a lot is compelling um you know i had a man that came to me he huge company, 40,000 people, and uh, they do 13 billion a year. And he said, I want my people to be more compelling. And I said, great, uh, we can do that. And he said, good. So you're going to, when we're done, we'll have the best business cases in the world because we were going to construct business cases in order to, he wanted them to deliver those in a more compelling manner. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, actually mm -hmm. compelling lives in the person, not in the case. And he stopped for a moment and he said, Wow. He said, I know that to be true just when you said it. He said, but no one's ever said that to me before. They're always telling me it lives in the case. Why doesn't anybody else know that? And so it's the it's the ability to actually make a point like that and then have somebody go, oh, I know that's true. Um, this person's going to work with my people to be more deeply rooted, to be more authentic. And you use a lot of words like that. I mean, what is if you know what's deeply rooted authentic authenticity if it's not the pinnacle of spirituality right so 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 there isn't there really isn't an issue if you can simply point to what it is that most companies are are trying to find the problem really is is that there isn't very many folks that know that or or bring that to place so there's 80 percent of what gets driven into corporations is this helicopter you know kind of thing from folks that really don't have experience they're you know, they're great writers and whatever they are, but most of them are not corporate people. They're not business people. They, they haven't really walked the path. And so, so that's really the problem in the corporate world is there's a, a richness of desire and there's a poorness of resources. And, and that's really what you see in that world. So you mentioned the word ego so and, I'm, the word and I'm ego and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself that, let me just turn my phone off because for some reason it echoes. Um, I'm thinking to myself about ego 
when I'm thinking about arrogance and I'm thinking about separatism, and then I'm thinking about the word uh, confidence. So the difference between arrogance and confidence is unifying and disunifying. So in essence, what you're doing is you're really giving them a grassroots uh, education in, in unifying the company and coming from a place of confidence rather than from arrogance. And, he, and seeing that in themselves. So, so what you just said is spot on. So the, the moment that we detour off the, the spiritual path is the moment that we're led to believe that we're the autonomous author of our own journey, as opposed to wow. consciousness creating that very same journey. So what you find, like Joseph Smith would talk about the original myth story, and, and that's the first story that arises. And that's the perfect story. Of course, we then take it and we you know, bastardize it by creating all sorts of woulds and coulds and shoulds. But if you can take somebody back to that rooted authenticity, what what right. rooted authenticity always does is it seeks to serve others because it has no boundaries. It doesn't recognize those boundaries. The self and the other melt together. And so really all you're doing is you're taking somebody back to their most authentic story, having them stand it. And all of a sudden what they discover is they want to help everybody. Right. They, they know that that boundary starts to drop. All of a sudden, they're a great leader in the company. The collaboration comes easy and people start to go, what's going on with that guy and or that gal? It, it can be male or female. It doesn't matter. And in fact, what's really interesting is in the work I'm doing today, I, I, I'm shocked. I have more women that I'm working with than men. And I never really would have thought that to, that that would be true. But it, it is. Um, but it's it's really a fascinating thing that when you render it that way and the way you just said it you, i could take you into a corporate boardroom and if you had talked about unifying and separating they would listen to that conversation right the minute you say something like uh, spiritual enlightenment then everybody kind of goes so it's 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 it so so it's just really a matter of rendering what you have to say in a way that meets the people that you're dealing with and and that's the magic of being able to do spiritual work in the in the corporate world because every human being wants to march back to that authentic self that's that's what the whole purpose and that's what the whole you know warp and woof is so it's not hard you're not selling anything you know you're actually telling them how to go where they want to go and yeah. and so that's what makes what you do so exciting and and it, and it's rare that you can't in a conversation point somebody in that direction so you mentioned that you're actually working with quite a few women and one of the questions that i wanted to ask you is the workplace has changed considerably in the last three months and i was wondering if you could address that what is it that you're seeing and what do you what do you feel that the intended or unintended consequences of all of this is going to be as far as the corporate world and the workplace is concerned well, I'll tell you one thing that's happening is I, I get a lot of calls now from people I haven't talked to in five years, 10 years. And they say, Alan, I remember when you talked about this, uh, this essence and this, uh, this whole piece that you talked about. And, you know, I ignored it at the time. And right now I want to talk to you about that. And, I'll, and I, I, that's probably happened 20 times in the last month. That shocks me. And so... What I what I think has happened in the world is that um, we've looked outside as a as a culture, and we're saying, you know what? I don't like what I see, and I don't like how we are. And and that's that's really great for the culture. But think about a business. When you run a business, the one thing you have to have is reliability. I have to know that this piece is going to move to that piece, and 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 it, without that reliability, the business you know, really can't be operated. So whenever you say to somebody, I don't like what I see out there and I want it to be different, that's a threat to every corporate organization. And it's, it's a threat to every organization, but certainly the corporate world. And so so I believe the corporate world right now is, is, is afraid. And I think that they're going into their kind of library bank and they're, they're saying to themselves, who have I ever heard that speaks to this particular issue? Um, and so it was really interesting when I wrote my, I wrote a book back in 2011 called Awakened Leadership. And, it, you know, books like that aren't big. They're not big hits in, in the, in the, in the big world, but it was really well received in the leadership business world. It was, 
It was a known book. It, it won writing awards. It's it's still used in several universities. Huffington Post reviewed it. I mean, it was a, you know, so people, and I thought to myself, I thought, why am I doing that? I'm just really trying to work at a few companies, you know, but I, when I wrote the book, all of this stuff happened. And it's really interesting that now people are coming back to me and they said, I read your book. And I remember you're the guy that went to the ashram and you're the guy that talks about authenticity and rootedness. And you're the guy that, you know, you, you, you say things that I think may give me an opportunity to get out of this place of fear about how to run my company. Because right now um, I'm concerned that I won't have the ability to walk back into my own organization and know what to do. That's it, it's it, because if you lose control of what the organization's intent is, of course, how do you put that, you know, how do you put that air back in the balloon? And so, so that, that really is, I think what you're seeing. And that's why they're asking the question. Um, there was a really interesting article that came out. I talked about the, what they call the PMC, which is the professional managerial class. And that class of people is doing an incredible introspection because they're working at home now. And what they found mm -hmm. out was that all of their essence was in the company with their friends and these kind of social contacts and the drama. They go home and work and all of a sudden it's them and their work and they're looking at their work and going, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm about. And so. Yeah. So that's really rattling. Think about it. You run a you run a successful hedge fund. You know, if you if you've ever done a hedge fund kind of work, it's boring. It's 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 like being an actuary. It's it's really boring. And so you go home and you do that for a few days, and you're probably going to ask yourself, really, you know, I, I spent an entire uh, uh, educational process. I've got a family. I got a whole world, and this is what I'm. This is it. And. Yeah. And so people know that's not it. And that's really bubbling the, the, that whole class of people. I mean, accountant, think of all the dreary things. I, I've been a CPA for 40 years. I still have my license. You know, I'm, I'm here to tell you the story of what you do is way more interesting than when you, you do a tax return. That's boring. But when, you, when the people come in and tell you the story of how the tax return came into being, that's actually interesting. So right. if those people just send you something on an email and you do the return. It's like, what a dreary dang job, you know? So, so that's, <laughs> that's happening a lot. It's like, it's, we're going, wait right. a minute. My life is more than that. It really is. And that, that's what's up in the corporate world right now. And, and I'm not sure, you know, I think some of the big companies like the high tech companies and the like, um, they're going to be challenged when people come back and folks say, yeah, I know I was your superstar before, but now I, I, I'd rather do something interesting. I don't care if it's as important and it makes you as much money, but I want to do something interesting. And if it's not with you, I'll do it with somebody else. Oh, by the way, I'm only working 30, I know that 60 hour a week thing. I'm doing 30 now. Um, right. And, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, you're, you're, I think you're going to start to see. And so how do you run a company when that's what's, when that's happening around you is the, um, you know, I think, I think is the, is the issue that that's really bubbling it, and, and it's tangible, right? Cause these people are having an experience of saying, wow, what I do really sucks. <laughs> you know? And, so and, and that's just, you, you can't live there. Really. So a company comes to you with just that question, look, this is what's happening. How do I handle this? What do I do? <laughs> how do you, how do you handle that question? Well, what I know is that when you take somebody back to the very beginning um, of who they are, what you do is you introduce them to what I call the original myth story. Story's a little like music in the intellect, right? In other words, it, it, you, can, you can write a story, but that's not the same as living a story. It's not the same as being in a story. When you were a kid and you read your first novel and you got under the blanket and you invited the goblins and the princesses in and they all flew around and hung with you, you... As a child, you didn't really know you weren't reality. That was reality. You created that story world. Well, companies have their own brand stories. And believe it or not, when you walk into a company, uh, one of the companies I work with, for instance, is Vans. And Vans is a big skater company. And if you know about skaters, it's all about authenticity, no posers. It's all, the ethos is all about that. So, And they worry about that story every day. And when you personalize that story, you make that story part of the people. Now it gets interesting again. Um, I, I remember once I walked in, company people know it's called North Face. 
and I walk into a, you know, what we call a cubicle farm. You've seen those, right? The companies that's all, you know, and all of these people were working. The, it was the accounts payable department, another really interesting thing to do. And, and, and I walked <laughs> up and I could feel there was, there was something really different in this place. I'm going, what's, so I walked up and I talked to this young woman. She was probably 25. I go, you've got to tell me, I can feel it. What's going on that's different here? And she says, oh, I can tell you that. That's easy. She says, in most companies, if you were in my, our position, you would think that what you were doing is accounts payable. She says, but you know what we're doing here is we're creating the next generation of conservationists. Wow. And I was like, and that's how you change it right there. When, when people doing accounts payable are living the story of creating the next generation of conservationists, accounts payable gets really interesting all of a sudden. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a whole camaraderie and an ethos that happens around that. So believe it or not, it's looking at what's the story of your company? What's the brand story? What does it need to do? And how do we hook these authentic human beings and their, and their, and their story that wants to serve? And how do we attach it like ornaments on a Christmas tree to your story? Because this is what they're doing. This is where the juice is, if you can give them that story. And, and of course, I mean, it, it, it sounds a little odd until you point out, for instance, that Nike is doing, I don't know, 20 billion a year. And they sell a $26 pair of sneakers for 256 bucks. So the other $230 is the story. They're selling the story of Nike and that's why people buy it. And, and, and you can tell them that and they go, oh, he's right. And I go, well, why, why shouldn't your story not be worth $230 a pair? You know, we, we, we should do the same thing. So there's a way to get to that that's credible that people will go, oh, yeah, you're right. When human beings are living a story, it's much more interesting when they're living than when they're living a spreadsheet. I, I, can, I can guarantee you, you know, that, that, that that's true. And so it's, it's, it's the difference between looking at notes on a page and saying that's music and hearing the music flow through the air. You know, you've, you've got to move one into the other. And if you can, then, you're, then you've got a synchronicity between humans. Humans want to live their story. All of us do. Um, take a look at you. I mean, you're this, you know, wise woman who is, I mean, in your world, people look at you and say, oh, I want, I, I want, I want to, you know, you, you know, you play that role. And we all are really excited about that. Well, I just told you a little story. You happen to be the main character, but that's just a story. And when Alan lives the story that he gets to talk to Abby, that's a pretty exciting moment, right? Because, you know, I get to talk to somebody who's basically going to share wisdom and kind of does what I do, but in a different world. And wow, this is going to be really juicy and fun. What a neat experience. Well, that's right. just what you, you know, you, th this could be just a question and answer period for, for all you and I know, but actually it's this other story that we're living that's way more exciting. And, and every human opportunity carries that with it. And we actually have convinced people that theories and concepts and spreadsheets are more important than that child's story under the blankets. And we, you have to turn that on its head. But isn't that what spirituality is anyway? Turning the logical life on its head? So no surprise that our childhood birthright is actually the biggest thing that we can embrace in terms of our journey. You know, who knew? Well, and I think it's one of the beauties of this country and of the American people is our sense of spontaneity, our sense of thinking outside the box, our thinking of creativity. I mean, we think we look at things like Walt Disney. Who would ever think of that? I mean, just so what advice would you give for in our last minute or two here for younger people as far as corporate world is concerned, as far as their workplace is concerned, especially in today's market? I would tell them, and this is the piece that I that that I was taught not to do. That I had to actually, you know, when I talked about getting Burke back up on the corporate beach, right? The 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 corporate and business platform is here and now for all of us that stand in it, and the only place that awakening can take place is here and now. So if you are a corporate animal like I am, this is where it's going to happen. So if you can just get your arms around that, so what's the story of you that has you standing in the middle of this corporate world? Mine is I can go into a, into a conference room and tell a story and everybody wants to write a check. 
You know, that was what I was really good at. That's a really handy talent to have. So <laughs> what is, is that? Well, I'm, I'm a storyteller. That's all I really am. And so, so to see that storytellers were just so important to the corporate world and then recognizing that that's what I am, I could embrace that. Then all of a sudden I was like, wow, um, you know, I understand now how to approach that. It's the embrace. So as a young person, I would say, what is your story? What's your authentic story? Find that, right? And then tell me um, or call me if you can't figure it out because I know where it fits. If you have an authentic story and you are a cor and you're a corporate business or entrepreneur, I can find your location on the map and I'll I'll help you embrace it if you want to. But but there is a place for you and the embracing of it. It's the it's this it's not seeing business as the bad thing, but knowing that that platform is if you think about the united states you just called that one in where where else is there the platform of business that you have here it's what we all are about in a lot of ways that's where our awakening is going to take place it's it's got to be there's no other place for it to take place so so the demand is going to going to continue to be infuse our corporate world with that essence and then we're going to have to tell those young people that are coming along, hey, I can get I can get you there a lot faster because it's the it's the embrace of your own authentic story and locating it in the world you want to go into and then being ruthlessly uncompromising about doing that. That's what I love about the new generation. They everybody criticizes them for it. The best thing about the new generation is they don't compromise on authenticity. So these are my people. I love these. I love these folks. I root for them hard because they'll walk into anywhere they want say I, i'll i'll go drive an uber i don't need your company those are the kind of people that are going to change our world they really right. are <laughs> right that's awesome um in the chat box prem subarna is saying that he wishes the interview was longer because it feels so good to hear alan and what he has to say is very reliable to the current corporate world so Prem, thank you so much for all your comments. And of course, Justine, who several of you met a few uh, weeks ago, Alan's wife, who's a yoga therapist and um, has the same tremendous spirit and sense of humor. And <laughs> they just celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary, which is awesome. So congratulations to you both. Um, thank you. Alan, thank you. I just, um, I've put into the uh, chat box the name of the book. So, you know, if you are interested in, in uh, in reading it, you'll you you have the title, and um, I I can't thank you enough. And for all of you that have dreams out there, you are opening your mouth like you want to say something. I was going to say anybody who watched this who wants a book, if you'll send me an email, I'll sign one and send it to you. I do that. That's my save up. Okay. Um, so anybody that's in your hearing and in this, if they want a book, just send me an address, and I will have one on its way. It may Let now. I live in Hawaii. Everything takes a week longer, but I'll have it on its way. <laughs> let, me, uh, tell, let me tell everyone how to reach you. Do you want to do that through your website? Uh, no, Alan, A L A N dot Shelton at Gmail. And if you put, put that in the box, and they can, like I say, anybody that wants a copy, send me an ad, send, me, send it to me. And I, I, and I make that offer, by the way, to companies, and it's I've, I've been doing that for years. I just I, I just send them out. It's um, it's it's kind of the you know it's funny when you when service calls you, you feel like anything I can put in their hands, I'll do it. So I always I always want to make it easy to understand what the story is about, so they can they can hold their own story. I get really you can tell I get excited about that. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so, so much um, okay. to people that are listening okay. still. Um, Sherry Silverman is with us next week to discuss conscious design. So for many of us who are moving from the office, the outside office to the inside office, meaning the office in our home, Sherry is going to be um, really helping us with, with how to, to plan that. 
because um, there really are directions, believe it or not, that are going to make it very easy for you in your new home office. And there are other directions that may actually hinder your work. So her conscious design uh, wisdom is going to be really beautiful to receive. Um, the last Wednesday of the month is with Swami uh, Dharmananda from the Shivananda Yoga um, Ashram. He is the assistant director of the ashram, uh, Yoga Farm um, Shivananda Ashram in, in Grass Valley, and the assistant director of their yoga therapy program, which is called the Shivananda Yoga Health Educator Training. So Swami Dharma will be speaking, of course, about Dharma, which is really key. And then I just found out yesterday that we have a surprise guest. I'm not going to tell you who it is. Um, I need to set up the time and set up the video. Um, but there's um, there's a beautiful video that was made by somebody who is very, very dear to all of us who have studied yoga and Ayurveda. Uh, it's a seven minute video and somebody from the Institute will also be speaking with us. So I will share the information on that as soon as I receive it. Whew. Got that through, got all of that done. So, um, Alan, thank you again so much. And Jennifer Deegan, you said I want to live in Hawaii too. Yes, me as well. So I think we'll all come and visit Justine and Alan. Come on over. Come on over. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Right? So aloha, congratulations yeah. again on your beautiful anniversary. Okay. Justine, give her a big hug. Love you both. Thank you so much. Will do. Okay. Bye. Bye.